The Wisdom of Solomon series has started, week one was parenting priorities, week two was sexual fidelity, and today is uh, money matters. I mean, money matters. And then next week, we'll probably close out the series. Luke 16, you there? Would you stand on your feet? Appreciate it. Verses 1 through 13. Here we go. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and said, what am I hearing about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be manager. This is the first you're fired episodes, what this is. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. Uh, I I know what I'll do. When I I lose my job here, I'm going to... Wait a minute. I've lost... I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. There it is. So he's trying to find a place to stay when he gets kicked out of his townhouse. That's what he's saying. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil. He replied, the manager said, hey, take your bill. Sit down quickly. Make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? And he said, 1,000 bushels of wheat. He replied, he told him, hey, take your bill and make it 800. The master, listen to this, crazy. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are people of the light. I tell you, this is a big verse, you use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little, that person can be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest or stingy with very little will be dishonest and stingy with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot. It doesn't say you should not. It says you cannot serve both God and money. Father, in Jesus' name, would you teach us only as you can, Holy Spirit. We invite you in the room. Already you're here with us as we worshiped and remembered what Jesus did for us. But would you... Be active and present in the teaching of the word today and not let the flaws or the finite vocabulary of a simple man dilute it, but may it be powerful, may it find its mark, and may you challenge us all to live up to uh, the blessed lifestyle of a Christian in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. You may be seated. Thanks for your standing. I appreciate that. Well, last week I was impressed with the number of times the word says sexual morality. If you'll remember pornea in the Greek and the Hebrew word matching it, I think it was like 80 some times the Bible talks about sexual morality. And I was like, oh, the Bible's pretty serious about this situation. And then I found out this week just how many times the Bible talks about money. There'll be a graph on the screen, but 2,000 times the Bible talks about money. And in comparison, it only talks about prayer and faith 500 times. Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven, more than he did prayer and faith. So evidently, Jesus knew it was going to be a big deal. Why is Jesus talking about money so much? Why is the word so directly dealing with money or possessions? And the answer is because I think he knew. He knew we would be working our fingers to the bone going after it or worried about it when we weren't getting it. We'd be worried about money. And let's be honest, everything can be right in your life, but if the money part is a problem, everything's not right in your life. Money stress can lead to marital stress. Money stress can lead to physical uh, disease and stress because, you know, stress affects your body. So I think God knew that he didn't need to shy away from this topic. So 2,000 times he mentions it in Scripture probably means I don't talk about it as much as I need to. I only mention it once or twice a year usually. But for today, let's, let's get after it and figure out what the Lord might say. In your outline, the big point of godly stewardship, the question, the big question you have to ask yourself is, what am I doing right now with what I have? Stewardship is about right now with present resources. It's not about when I win the lottery. It's not about when I get a raise, when I get out of college, when I get out of this part-time job. It's about what am I doing right now with what I have, not what I used to do with what I have, what am I doing right now with what I have. And then we get into this parable. And I've got to be honest, I've never liked this parable. It sounds weird. It seems like a dishonest dude is getting away with being dishonest more. 
because he went and che- it seemed like he cheated his boss out of more money by changing the bills. And yet, at the end of this thing, the Bible clearly says the master commended the dishonest manager. Mind blown. I don't get it. So you have to dig and figure out what's going on here. So this guy's been unethical. I don't know if it's embezzlement or he's just lazy and he's good for nothing employee, but he's called out. And his boss comes in and said, you're going to be fired. But evidently, he's got a window of time to get, his act, uh, to get his act together, get his stuff in order, to tie up all the loose ends. So as he knows, he's got a little limited time here, he thinks to himself, I'm in deep weeds. What am I going to do? I'm a desk jockey. I can't dig ditches. I, I'm not that birdie guy who can work outside. And I'm too proud to beg, so I can't be on the street begging for help. I've got to figure out what. Then he says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make some friends so that when I get kicked out of my place, they'll welcome me into their place. And he goes to the guys who owes his boss money, and he says, hey, what was your bill? And the guy says, hey, 1000 bucks." And he said, I'm going to make you a deal today. Let's cut it down to 500 Would you like me if I cut it down to 500 You know I would like you if you $500 it is. How much do you owe? And he goes over and he's like, 900 So he cuts it to 450 So you get the picture. So after the guy's wheeling and dealing like this, which seems to be that he's cheating his boss out of more money. Am I alone in this? Doesn't this sound weird? And the boss man comes back and he commends, look, at, look on the screen. He commends the dishonest manager. That part alone just irritates me. He commends the dishonest manager. Why? Not for his dishonesty, but because he acted shrewdly. And here's what the scripture says. If you go to the next, next one, he says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Jesus is saying, you and how you manage your financial life right here, right now, has a direct correlation with how you will be rewarded in eternity. You cannot shake that law. However you're faithful with what he's given you now, however generous you are with what he's given you now, will affect eternity. That's the first thing we get out of this parable. But the second one, I think, is the most powerful, is why he, uh, why he commended the dishonest manager was because the dishonest, he wasn't commended for how bad of a job he did. He wasn't commended for cheating his boss out of more money. He was commended because he acted shrewdly with the little time he had left. It's what he did with the opportunity he had. In other words, you have screwed up from from the time you were called out back. You were sorry and pathetic. Right here, you took the opportunity and advantage of the little bit of time before I kicked you out of my office. You did right by taking that little opportunity and wisely using it for good. Now, here's where we come in the story. We can draw a line right here today, and it doesn't matter what you've done before this moment. You could have been a frivolous, going into debt for anything you wanted, lazy, not working hard enough, uh, stingy, greedy, uh, not generous at all. You could be all those things and worse before this moment. And you can still look at this parable and say, but after this moment, I've got opportunity. I've got a chance to rewrite the story from what I was and that's why the God honors and commends this guy, not because of what he was, but because he realized the little time he had left, I'm going to use it wisely. And however much time you've got left on this globe, if we use it wisely, I think it's going to reward us in eternity. That's, that's the point of the parable. So now we go to the wisdom of Solomon. If I I, almost, I, I, I talk sometimes like if I was old enough to be your dad and then I realized For some of you, I am, and that hurts really bad when I come to that realization. It's on the fly sometimes. It'll just hit me in the middle of this thing. So for some of you, I'm old enough to be your dad, and some of you, maybe an older brother, and uh, some of you, thank God, I'm still younger than a few of you. Here's what I would tell, and here's what I've told my daughter about finances. Number one, you've got to work hard. You're not going to stay at home. You're not going to scroll through TikTok and live off of us. You've got to go get it. Work hard. Proverbs 10, 4, lazy hands make for poverty, but Solomon said diligent hands bring wealth. Proverbs 14, 23, all hard work brings a profit, but just talking about it leads to poverty. When it was legal for me to get a job, I got a job. The birthday, when I turned legal age to have a job, I got a job, prestigious job. 
I was bagging groceries at Ingalls in Wahala, South Carolina. I was making a whopping minimum wage of $3.35 an hour. And I thought I was living high when I got a 10 cent raise within three to six months. I said, I'm going to own this place before long. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to own this place. Bag groceries. So really, it was just so I could put gas in the car. Anybody ever done that? I just, I just need a job. Get gas in the car and take, take girls out. That's all I wanted to do. Got that job. Get out of high school. Then I'm painting schools in the maintenance department of the school system for a summer. Then I get into college. Then I work fast food at Arby's. Minimum wage. Making it. After Arby's, I got in, uh, in the shop of our department, in the ag engineering department. Then I worked in the shop part-time in between classes. Get out of college. Turn down engineering jobs. Thank you very much, Lord, for that direction. And I begin working at a rent-to-own place. If you don't know what a rent-to-own place is, may I educate you? These are people who unfortunately have not managed their finances well enough to buy a TV or VCR or sofa outright. So they rent it week to week. Nothing against the people, it's just what situation they're in. Unfortunately for me, when they couldn't afford two weeks in a row, I had to go confiscate said property. Meaning they never like to see me coming because I'm either wanting payment or I'm wanting the TV back. You know what I'm saying? That was a fun job. Did that. Worked in an electrical supply warehouse, did that. Finally got a youth pastor job here four and a half years. Went to pastor in LaGrange. That went great for 10 years till I screwed that up. Then in the middle of 08, 09, the only job I could land coming back from LaGrange to here was a custom closet salesman job. Do you remember what was going on in 2008 and 2009? Let's just say people weren't spending money on luxury closets. Let's just say that. Not a great few months I had right there. Then finally, I got into project manager with banks and credit unions. And then after that, I finally landed here again in 2015. All that to say, why are you telling me your life story? Because there's not been one month of my life I haven't had a job. Fast food, bagging groceries, repo and VCRs, or ministry, I had a job. It's okay. You could have a full-time job. You can have two part-time jobs. You can have a full-time job and a side hustle. You can have five hustles and a part-time job. All that's okay. What's not okay is being 30 years old and living off your mom and daddy. That's not okay. What's not okay is you being at home playing video games while your wife is out there working to keep your lights on. That's not okay. What's not okay is figuring out how to work the government system, have another baby so your government check gets bigger. That's not okay. Get a job. Go work and get yours. There is no wealth. There is no prosperity. There is no blessing for trying to work a system or trying to live off somebody else. That's socialism. I'm not even going to go there. Get a job. Somebody say, get a job. job. And not only, and keep it. That's a, yeah, that's, I kind of meant that to be assumption there. And keep it. And you know what? In saying that, Christians should be the best people in the company. Work as unto the Lord, Colossians 3.23 said. You should be the best person bagging groceries. You should be the most on-time person in the office. You should be the hardest working person on the crew. Why? Because you're not working for a paycheck and you're not working as unto the supervisor. You're working as unto the Lord to honor him in what you do. Get a job. Work hard. Number two, budget conservatively and borrow cautiously. There's that curse word, that B word, budget. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of hardworking people earn a profit, but those who act too quickly become poor. Let's leave that one on the screen. I'm going to put the CST on it, the Chad Smith translation. The plans of a hardworking person, that's, that means budget. It's not in the Hebrew, but I promise a plan is a budget. And those people who don't have a plan, they quickly become poor. Why? Because if you don't have a plan or don't have a budget, then every shiny gadget you're going to buy. If you find $50 in your wallet and there's a new shirt you want for $42, you've got the money, you buy it. And all you're doing is acting off of impulse and not plan. And if you have no budget, that means you have no margin and all you're doing is spending what you have. And unfortunately, most people spend more than they have. Talk about that in a second. But when I'm talking about budgeting, you need to get down with what you bring in and start planning out what expenditures will take place, okay? 
And I used to teach it this way, but I'm going to put it on steroids today. I used to say you always need to spend less than what you earn. And that's still true. Okay? I mean, let's just get to the brass tacks mathematics of it. You need to spend less than what you've got coming in. Here, I want to just put a, a, a jolt of steroids in that. You need to spend less than you need. Here's what I mean by that. Here's what people do. As soon as they get a raise... They were living off this just fine. They were driving this car and it was just fine. But they get a little bump and all of a sudden they realize they can get a better car. They don't need a better car, but they get one because they can. And they eat up all the blessings that God is affording them. So if you really, really want to get wise, the wisdom of Solomon says, you need to budget and have a plan and don't spend more than you need. So that as God blesses you, there's more margin for savings or more margin for investment or more margin for generosity. But if all you do is spend, spend, spend because you make more, that is not the key to financial blessing. Then the other, not just budget conservatively, borrow uh, cautiously. As little as possible. And in America, that's just, nobody likes that. Because we are, a, our nation's a... Our nation doesn't even show us how to do this. The United States of America is $35 trillion in debt as a country. If you want to get depressed, go to the website that talks about uh, the debt, and it's got a moving, it moves on the fly of our debt as it's climbing every second. Oh my gosh. And then I saw like the, just the interest on the uh, national debt is like millions of dollars every day. Yeah, so we don't need to learn from our government. They don't have a clue, obviously, how to balance a budget. And then the populace of our country doesn't do much better because the collective populace of our country has $17.5 trillion of debt itself. You start breaking that down, people who have a credit card debt, the average household that holds credit card debt is in $20,000 in consumer debt. Not a car, not a house, just stuff. Nothing to show for it. $20,000 is the average credit card debt. Student loans, sounds great when you're a freshman in college. Not so great when you just get out of school. The average student loan debt is $60,000. And if all we're doing is paying the minimum payments on these, the 17 18% credit card interest rates, that hit, you are not be, you're not living a prosperous life. You're not living a wise life. You are strangled by this thing called debt. So just because the bank says you're approved doesn't mean you need it. Just because a credit card sends you another, uh, another credit card to company, says, hey, we want your business, rip it up and throw it in the trash. You don't need another credit card. You need to pay off the two you got right now. That's what you need to do. Don't take another credit card. Borrow cautiously. Matter of fact, anything, I'm, kind, I'm not as strict as Dave Ramsey. That guy's, you know, so he's... If it's not a car or a house, I, I just don't like, don't borrow. Just don't get it. And sometimes those cars, are, anyway, borrow cautiously. Somebody say amen to that. Number three, invest wisely. Invest for the future. Proverbs 13, 11, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. One statement, get rich quick, schemes are not out there. If something's promising you 50 to 1 in six months, it's a lie. Or it's illegal. I don't know which one, but something's going on there. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a big risk you're going to lose. But the money that grows little by little, that's what grows. And then Solomon kicks in and says, but it's not okay just to put it under your mattress. A good person leaves an inheritance not just for their children, but for their children's children. So that attitude with some of us, especially when we see our kids you know, spending all their money on whatever they spend their money on, you're like, I'm going to spend their inheritance. I'm going to go on cruises. And I'm gonna, I had to make it. They're going to have to make it on their own. Solomon says, well, really a righteous person leaves something for their kids and their grandkids. And you can't do that just by putting money under a mattress. Even one of the parables of Jesus said, you should at least put it in the bank and had some interest grow with it, right? So here, here's the wisdom. Save something every month. Save something every month. We started a 529 for Alex for college when she was a baby. $100 a month. I know that sounds like it ain't going to do nothing. 
$100 a month, and we never backed off from it. Even when I screwed up our life and I came back and tried to sell closets to a, to a depressed market, and our income basically was cut by 66%, even in those first three or four months, we said, we're not coming off the 529 the $100 is going in there. We never came off of that. And by the time she goes to school, of course, she earned some scholarships. She was able to go through all school with scholarships and no debt. And that's, that's what I think a wise parent will do. They will plan. And you, it's not $500 every week. $100 a month, 18 years. And it begins to work. And savings works the same way. 401k works the same way. Retirement works. Invest for the future, y'all. Then finally, number four, if you really want God's hand on you, if you really want God to help you in the area of finances, you need to honor him through generous giving. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first and best part of your income. He comes first. He's the very first part of our... If he's Lord of everything, that means he's got to be Lord over your finances. And by honoring him with the first and best of it, you're saying, God, I recognize that I didn't get this because of me. I got this because you blessed me with this, right? If I have anything, it's because of the goodness of the Lord on my life. Because at the, and if I don't get that, God forbid he teaches me a lesson and takes his hand off of me to where it all crumbles down. God forbid I lose the job because I'm so haughty thinking my skill set and my resume got me here. God's hand is on me. God's hand allowed me the experience. God's hand allowed me the education. God's hand, hand gives me breath in my lungs to go to work. So every time I get some type of increase, income, paycheck, I have to say, God, it's because of you I even have what I have. Even if it's not as much as I want, I still have this because of you. And I'm going to honor you with the first and best. There's three levels of giving, and I, I hope you get in one of them today. Or maybe you even take another step. But the first one is called percentage giving. Percentage giving is just you saying, I'm going to give a percent off the top from the very first of it. The very first is going to go to God. In the Old Testament, they called it tithing. Tithing means 10%. And it was part of the Old Testament law. And we see in Malachi 3, God visits them through the prophet and says, I got a little bone to pick with you boys. He says, you're robbing me, if you put it on the screen, you're robbing me of the offerings and of the 10% that belongs to me. I am the Lord all-powerful, and I challenge you to put me to the test. Bring the entire 10% into the storehouse so there will be food in my house. Then, if then, if then, then I will open up the windows of heaven and flood you with blessing after blessing. That was what God challenged them with in Malachi. Now, if, if you're a student of the Word, you might say, well, that's an Old Testament thing. We don't have to do that today. Okay, well, just would you put your defense walls down just for a second? Jesus in Luke eleven forty two 42 says that you Pharisees, you should tithe, yes, but don't neglect the more important things. Tithing, if you go, uh, I'm going to turn to something that's not on the screen right quick, if you don't mind. Tithing is not even an Old Testament law thing. It goes way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. So Genesis chapter 14, Abraham's won this huge battle. He's got all kind of spoils for more. In other words, he's just got a payload. He hit pay dirt. And he's coming back, and this strange character in the Bible called Melchizedek shows up to him. Melchizedek is a high priest, and it says he's the king of Salem, king of Shalom, king of peace, y'all. And what does he bring, Abraham? Bread and wine. Communion. Come on, somebody. I believe this is a theophany. I believe this is God incarnate in human form. And Abraham recognizes that Melchizedek, he may not have recognized it was Jesus, but this guy's the high priest. He's a top dog. And when Abraham saw who he is, the king of peace, he's offering bread and wine. Abraham says, Here. Here's 10% of everything I just got. It wasn't a law. It wasn't an obligation. It wasn't an expectation. It was a heart that Abraham said, I didn't get all this just because of me. So here, his grandson did the same thing before Moses put it into law. Then Moses put it into law. And from that point on, the entire Old Testament, his people were expected to tithe. And here was God's promise to them. Everybody say, I'm listening. This is crazy. He said, I promise you. 
if you give me the first 10% of your income, I'm going to put my hand on the other 90%, and it's going to go farther than your 100% would have went by itself. That's his promise to us. Now, now you, you may say, That's, that sounds crazy. Hey, can I just give you a little form? Can we do 10, 10, 80? This is a beautiful little simplified plan of what to do with finances. 10% goes to God. 10% goes to you for your future. Save. Invest. And then 80% is lifestyle. Subscriptions. Getting out of debt. Keeping the power on. As expensive as that was this summer for me. I mean, that, that, that's 80%. 10, 10, 80. But God said, if you'll honor me with the first 10, I'm going to bless your socks off and the rest of everything else. Now, you may say, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can let go of that much money. Well, I'm going to pray for you right quick. And I'm going to pray that God decreases your income so that you're comfortable paying tithes. If that's too much money for you to tithe off of, let's just pray that God brings you down to the level you're like, oh, I can do that. Does anybody want to pray that? Nobody wants to pray that prayer. But the point is this, y'all. It's, it's just, is it an obligation? Somebody says, do I have to tithe to go to heaven? I know you're really keen. You want to hear this one. Do I have to tithe to go to heaven? No. You can't do anything to pay your way into heaven. That's ridiculous. You don't read your Bible enough to go to heaven. You don't pray enough to go to heaven. Tithing is not an obligation for you to go to heaven. Tithing is an invitation for you to trust God. It's not a you have to. It's, it's a God saying, will you trust me here? Will you trust me that I'll take care of you to the point that this makes no sense to the world, but I'm going to make a believer out of you that I will bless you if you trust me. Now, I used to be a stickler, y'all. I know it's hard to believe that I was a very hard-nosed stickler. But I used to say, 10% or nothing. Didn't quite say it that way. But in my mind, I said, you should be tithing, tithing. And I still think God will honor you if you will. But you know what? Okay. If you don't think you can trust God enough for 10%, make me an offer. I'm, I'm just, you know, I think God will meet you at 5%. I think if he sees your heart says, I can't do much, but I'm going to try three. I'm going to try this out at 3%. Try it. I don't think God's going to thump you on the head. That ain't 10, doofus. I don't think that's what God's going to do. I think he's going to see you're trying to put him first as, with as much faith as you can muster because probably most of us in the room, I, I, I don't know your business, but a lot of people are strapped financially by debt. Student loans, credit card debt, a lot of you are just barely making it. You're week to week, you're barely getting by, and you're saying, I can't let go of another $10. So 3% for you may be a big deal. I think God will see that. I think God will honor that. But for goodness sake, just don't leave and say, well, I can't do that. Just pick a percentage that you'll try. Say, God, I'm going to give this a try for 90 days. I'll, I'll give this a try for a month. I promise you he'll show up. When you put him first, he shows up in your life. There's no, I've done this my entire life. I, I said I've never been without a job since I was 16. I tithed before I had a job, y'all. You know what I'm saying? If, if I got an allowance, we had to bust the dollar up and get 10 dimes out of it because a dime was going to Jesus. I, I've never, and you know what? God has never let me down regarding what I needed in life. I've not always driven the most fancy car, but he's taken care of me every day of my life. And blessed us. If you look overall, uh, he's blessed us. He kept, on, he kept on blessing us forward. There were down seasons. There were dry times. There were selling closets when nobody wanted to buy one. There was times when I didn't know how Alex was going to get a Christmas. Can I tell you what happened when we were in that season where we didn't have but a third of the income we were used to, but we kept tithing? God put on somebody's heart in LaGrange, Georgia. Her name is Katrina. She sent us a $10,000 check in the mail, knew what we were going through. I remember the day we were said, I don't know if Alex is going to get Christmas this year. And that week in the mail came the check. That's not me. That's God saying, you think I'm going to let you be faithful to me all the years of your life and you hit this down season and I'm going to let you down? No. Nah. He'll put it on somebody's heart over here who's stupid blessed and just bless, your ch bless his children. That's what he does. And just, just decide, hey, 3%, I'm going to try this. 5%, 10%, I'll try this. Then you go into plus giving. 
Somebody want, might be here already. Plus giving his tithes and offerings. This is what he said in Malachi 3. Should people cheat God? Yet you've cheated me. You ask, what do you mean? How have we cheated you? Where did we cheat you? You've cheated me in the tithes and offerings. So God says, you know, not only is it 10%, but if I bless you enough, there should be some offerings on top of that. Plus giving is generosity. Plus giving is when you give above and beyond that baseline. So anybody giving to the new worship center, listen to me. You're in plus giving. If you've tithed and you're going, that's plus giving. If you're, if you're honoring, if you're blessing to Koa life and you're tithing, that's plus giving. You're generous. If Coleman Bailey comes and he talks about the orphanage in DR Congo and you put out a $50, $50 I'm going to bless the DR Congo orphanage. That's plus giving. That's generosity. God loves it. You don't have to. You'll want to. You've already done the percentage thing, but I want to give to them too. You know somebody with a medical crisis and you throw $500 at them. That's plus giving. And God says, you know, I'm not going to let you out give me. And he promises if you give, it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God's going to pour it on you because he loves a cheerful. You know, that's in the Bible. He loves a cheerful giver. I don't know how you envision that. The actual word means hilarious. It's like, <laughs> you know, they're throwing the, ah, let me give you some more, let me give you some more. It's actually people who like, it actually takes it to the next level. It's prolific giving. And the band can come on out. Prolific giving is, prolific is just abundant, plentiful. These people are like next level generous. Like, instead of asking how little can I get away with giving, these people are like, what can I do to give more? These people are like looking for opportunities to make a difference above all the other giving. They're like, I think I'll work overtime this weekend so I can bless the missionary, so I can bless my neighbor, so I can bless uh, Stevens County Christian Learning Center. I think, I think I'm going to sell one of my 10 acres and just use that to bless. They're trying to figure out ways they can be more generous. And I, that's just, God loves that. And a hilarious giver is just like, what else can I do to give more? And this is when they know God has taken care of them to the level that there's no matter what they give, God is always going to be pouring it back. John Maxwell calls it the big shovel principle. I don't know if y'all have ever heard this. The big shovel principle is we're shoveling into ministry. We're shoveling into people. We're shoveling into the kingdom. And he keeps shoveling back because he's not going to be out giving. And he's got a bigger shovel than we do. So we're shoveling out blessings. And he says, okay. And he shovels it back. And he's, he shovels so much bigger. And I don't want you to just get tunnel vision with dollar signs. I think he shovels blessings back on our marriage. I, I, think, I think our faithfulness and our finances had a, a good bit to do with our marriage restoration. I believe he's blessed our health over the years. I believe our washing machine worked a whole lot longer than it should have on occasions. Come on, somebody. I don't know about, well, how you, we, we laid hands on appliances. I don't know if anybody else did. If they stopped working, we didn't start looking for a new one. We started laying hands on those suckers. Can you find that in the Bible? Nope, but we prayed over it. It worked. I ain't even kidding you, y'all. That sucker started working again. God can put hands and bless things that you may not even be considering what he's doing, but he's doing them. And that's what happens when we honor him with the best and first of what we have. That's wisdom from Solomon. Now, here's the question in closing here. If everything was good in your life, right? If your bills are paid, you're, you're getting ready, you're, you got a college fund for your kids, your retirement's looking okay. If everything was great, which level at giving would you want to be on? Would you want to be on the percentage or plus, or would you want to be prolific and just, man, I just want to bless people. If, if your life was good, if God has blessed you to the point where there's not a worry about this stuff, which, which level would your, how generous would your heart be? And that says a lot about you. I mean, if you're in here and you're super blessed and you're still with the, how little can I get by with giving? That's, that's a heart problem, y'all. That's something's not right here. But if your heart says, man, I wish, I wish I could just go crazy giving. That's where your heart should be. But can I just encourage you to do this? Everybody say, I'm listening. What's, 
what's the one step you can take just to get a little closer to that direction? What's the one step you could take? It, just, just one step, not, not three steps, not five steps. What's the one thing you can do to show the Lord, I'm trusting you enough, I'm going to take a step. I'm, I'm, I, have not, I don't tithe, I tip. A lot of people tip, they don't tithe. You know what you do when you tip? You tip when you feel good about the way things went at the table. You'll tip God when you feel like the month is pretty good and the, and the bills wasn't quite as high as you were expecting, so you'll tip him. So if you've been tipping, say, God, I'm going to stop tipping, and I want you to know that every week I'm going to be bringing 4% to you. That's a step. Or if you've already been at 6%, so I just want you to know, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you for the 10. I'm going to trust you with 10%. And you bring it to, to the house of the Lord, and it's, a, it's an act of worship. And watch what God does with that step. I promise you, he's going to meet you in that step. Has anybody lived this out to know he's faithful? Could somebody say amen to that? Would you clap for the Lord if you know he's been faithful to you? Hey, I, I thought better that. I thought I had a good idea, but I don't think it was a good idea, so... Oh, uh, yeah, I won't do that. Okay, but um, how, many has, how many has tithed for over 30 years now in your life? Would you raise your hand? You've been a tither for 30 years plus. Has he been faithful? <laughs> Come on, y'all. He's faithful. Would you stand on your feet, everybody? Father, in Jesus' name, my prayer is that if somebody is far from you, Lord, I, I don't want anything from these guys. I, I, I want blessings for them. And uh, Lord, if somebody is here and the, the enemy loves to use a topic like this and whisper to them, church just wants my money. Father, would you just assure them that you just want their heart. You just want their heart. And uh, Lord, if they're far from you or if they're if they've backslidden, if they've never really trusted you with their life, I pray that this is a day, for, forget the financial talk, this is a day where they trust you not with their wallet, but their life, their heart. And Lord, they say, I need, I need to trust, I need to give you my life. I pray that happens as we sing this song. And Lord, for those who do live for you and they've been challenged a little bit and they know it was the Spirit talking to them and not, not a preacher, Father, help them to see that next step they can take because I know blessings are going to follow that blessings on their home, their children, their marriage, their finances, their vehicles, their careers, their jobs, all of it. Father, help us to take that next step, I ask in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.